Okay, and then this is something that uh, once you've got your canvas built up, I, I kind of s stress this um, quite a bit more now than before. So before I used, to, I used to be an advocate of take your canvas, go out there and start interviewing customers and start learning right away. Um, and, it's the, the, and the problem with that is that because a lot of that learning is qualitative, because a lot of it does take time, and time not so much to run the interviews, but to schedule them, to make sure people show up, to actually run the interviews, collect all the results, it does take time. We're talking in the order of, in a, in a very fast case, if you have got just people lined up and you're interviewing people every day, it could take as little as two weeks, but on average it takes more like six to eight weeks. And so that's a lot of time you're spending going and, and, and talking to these people. And I found that if you can instead go out and find advisors who have done similar things, you can get a lot of um, kind of obstacles cleared for you uh, just, just through that conversation. So much like we did today, like being able to present this canvas up to a room full of people may have given AT some, some actionable stuff to maybe say, let me go back and think about these risks which I hadn't thought about before. And if he does similar things with people who have maybe been in the email campaign business and they have more insights than any of us in this room, those are ways for him to, again, take advantage of learning of other people who have been there, done that. So, so I guess since writing my first book, a lot of people have seen the, cloud, have seen the Cloudfire case study and I've had uh, a number of entrepreneurs who are building not similar products but going after similar markets, going after parents' markets. And they, they have contacted me and asked me about you know, how, how um, like what my learnings were, what my experiences were setting interviews. And I've shared a lot of tactics and a lot of learnings with them, which I would estimate kind of on average saves them three to four months of just of, of, of that learning, which is huge in the earlier stages. I mean, that's three to four months where they're not potentially making any revenue. It's a lot of, a lot of runway time that they can get just by talking to me for like 30, 40 minutes. And I think you can similarly go and handpick uh, advisors. And I use the word advisor loosely because these could be seasoned entrepreneurs who have done a similar service. They could be existing entrepreneurs building something that's not competitive. It could be potential partners. Um, they could just be potential investors, all kinds of people. They could even be customers of yours that, that you want to just go in and they have, uh, they have more insights into the problems than you do. And so you're looking to get their feedback. So all of those are ways of putting this in front of it. But I will, I will kind of caution you with the advisor paradox, which the Venture Hacks guys put out there a while back. And that is that this business model is yours. And so the idea is not to go to an investor or go to an advisor and have them dictate what you should go do. So everything I told you, you don't have to listen to an ounce of it. It's really, at the end, your, your, it's your product, and that's your business model, and what you're building is yours. And so what, what you have to do is pretty much synthesize all the feedback you're getting in. and if. Advisors will drive you, and they'll drive you nuts. They'll drive you in many different directions, because they are because they are bringing in their own myopic view. So we talked about the canvas being this nine nine box kind of view of a startup, and everyone has a different perspective and a different um, experience they bring into it. Customers can talk about problems. Your job is to build a solution primarily, and then if you can find advisors to fill the other gaps, people who have done similar things, the analogs, the antilogs of other business models. It kind of informs your decision to, to kind of mitigate risk or at least on paper be able to avoid a lot of traps that you may eventually run into. So that's why this process is a, is a very valuable one. And, and using a tool like this um, kind of makes that easy. I can put this canvas in front of somebody at a coffee shop and really do a business model interview. I like to call it business model discovery versus customer discovery. I can do a business model interview and get that feedback which I then kind of use to, 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 to run my, to inform my, my experiments, inform the kind of startup that I, I go build after that. So let's talk about, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, just going back a little bit. Um, uh, how do you figure out what the market size is? Like, sure, so I, I would say like th th there are tools out there. I mean, there are, there, first of all, there are reports out there depending on what kind of market you're doing. Um, sometimes you can, you can pick on those. Sometimes you can, if you're going after a segment like, you know, moms, you know, people use all kinds of tricks from looking at, you know, Google, Google data to like looking at even Facebook data. Like you can go down to, like, if you look at the Facebook ads, for example, you can do a lot of segmentation. And because there's so much data around there about who are, um, you, know, uh, you know, moms with kids, you can actually find that number in Facebook. Um, and that is a, is a, is a, you know, good place to start. Um, and there, there, there are many people who have like written blog posts. If you just do, if you actually search, like Noah has a very good post on Noah Kagan from AppSumo. So if you search Noah Kagan, AppSumo and market sizing, he has a very good set of tools that he uses for finding out. He has a fictional Chihuahua um, 
product that he ha that he uses, but he walks you through the process of how do you pretty much find the market size for Chihuahua owners. And so you can do all kinds of those things to get a very rough estimate. But like in my case, I didn't even go through a lot of that hassle because I just know that there are, there are many parents out there and there are lots of, there's, there's a lot of need of this and it, it seemed to be just big enough. So I don't necessarily have to go down to, to kind of the exact numbers. Okay, one more question. Uh, seeking advisors, how do you know where to look? Yeah, so, it's, yeah, so, so I, I, that's a good question. I think it's, it's very much like, like finding early customers. Um, what, what I would do is pretty much reach out to people and try to see if they'll meet you at a coffee shop or meet you at wherever they want to meet and, you know, for advice. And you pretty much, and the people, you know, the people do it for different reasons. Some are professional advisors, you know, they want to, to find good startups where they, they get an equity stake and they want to become advisors. Um, others are really just doing it to give back. Others have experience. If you, if somebody calls me and said, I know you've been, you, you have a lot of experience with the parent market, I'd like to just spend 20 minutes with you, I'd probably give them my time, like, you know, no matter who they are. So it's just a way of, like, giving back, and many people would do it. Now, the interesting thing there, though, is that finding good advisors is a hard thing. As I said, a lot of people will give you really bad advice. And so it's your job to synthesize that advice. But if you find somebody who is consistently giving you good advice, try to recruit them and try to build them, bring them onto your advisory board. And again, there are lots of ways. And the Venture Hacks guys have some good, good ways on how you structure that and how much equity and all of that stuff. So if you, those details are all um, pretty, pretty out there.